Hey everyone, welcome back to the other side of weight loss. Well, we've all heard the term sugar is the devil. At least I have many times in my life. I think that was driven into my brain as a child growing up was like, you stay away from sugar and this low carb craze that we've all been in for the last couple of years being told that, you know, carbohydrates are the devil, that sugar is the devil. Well, what if it isn't? What if there's some sugars that your body absolutely should be having in order to have a properly functioning metabolism? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about here today is what can we do to have a great metabolism and how sugar maybe just has to be part of that. So my guest today is Kate Deering. She is uh, has been involved in the health and fitness industry for over 25 years. Her expertise is based on certifications as a Czech exercise coach, a Czech holistic lifestyle coach, uh, number two, this is the number two in there, Olympic lifestyle, I'm like two, Olympic lifting coach, a Z health practitioner, and a certified nutritional consultant. Kate is the author of the book, How to Heal Your Metabolism, which gives a completely different perspective on what is healthy for you and what is not. If you think you're doing everything right and are not getting the results you want, you need to read this book. You can find Kate at katedaring.com. So welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Yes. So, Kate, um, your background is a very typical background. You were like a fanatic exerciser, weren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I grew up as an athlete as a child, and yeah. then I got into the fitness industry because I was probably a little obsessive um, and have literally been here my entire life in some fan of, uh, way or, or, or so. So, <clears throat> but I, I was in the obsessive, like workout every single day, two hours a day. Like I think wow. a lot of women get into, yes. um, to a point where it wasn't really serving me to the, to the way that I thought it would or should. Yeah. And so how long were you in that lifestyle before things started to go wrong? Like at what age did you start thinking, Hmm, this is maybe not working for me. Yeah. So after I was probably about 38, 39, you know, so oh, okay. I was hitting, I was yep. creeping up to 40 and everyone always, that's why yep. 40 was going to be that age. And I was like, no, I'm already so healthy. I work out all the time. I have a good diet. How could possibly, I'm not going to be that person. And sure enough, 38, 39, all of a sudden things started going sideways. And uh, I started gaining weight, having hormonal issues. And I, I mean, I was getting fatigued, tired. I mean, there was a lot of things happening that I wasn't really enjoying. And so I kind of, my brain thought, well, I guess this is what 40 is. And this is what's happening. And this is part of aging. And even though I was still working out quite hard, um, things were not going in a way, you know, and it was either accept it or work harder. That was either what, one way or another. Yeah. And so did you, did you try working out harder? Initially. Initially. Yeah. <laughs> that was the only answer I had. Initially, yeah. I think I was cycling. I was trying, I think at that point I was just beginning to start cycling. Um, I stopped running as much. I was, you know, I'd run marathons before because of injuries. So I started cycling. And so I was like, I just need to work harder. And yeah, that was my initial thought was I just need to push it. And um, that was the absolute wrong answer. In fact, yeah. it, it was probably I needed to do the opposite. Yeah. And it always happens at 38, 40. Like that is the total turning point for every woman. I swear. It's like, yeah, you, everything could be working for you until that point, until you hit 38. And then 40, it was like, it was literally like my birthday. And it, I felt like, a whole bunch of stuff just went wrong in my body. I was like, what just <laughs> happens? <laughs> yeah. And I would actually say in today's, it seems to be happening earlier. It does. Women. You know, yeah. I certainly hear women in their early thirties that are hitting these walls. Um, you know, so it, I think it's just the surmountable amount of stress we're all under at this point. And it's just more and more and more and more. And so it's the people are crashing way earlier. Yeah. So not only were you working out excessively, like two hours a day, what did, what was your diet like at that time? Yeah. So at that time I was doing pretty much a low carb. I wasn't like a no carber or keto. I was, but I was low, you know, 50 to hundred grams a day, um, which would be equivalent to like a couple apples or uh, maybe a half a cup of oatmeal and a couple apples. It was pretty minimal. I mean, I did a lot of green vegetables, a lot of protein and nuts and seeds and all those things was the basis of my diet. And, you know, for me, I thought that was, that was a great diet, clean, 
you know, not a lot of fats, so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but that was not, and I was lean. I mean, even in this time, initially prior to that, I was a pretty lean person. So, and, but unfortunately, when I would work out to get lean, it was never something that I could sustain. You know, at uh -huh. some point in time, I would fall off because it was just, you know, we can't sustain that lifestyle in, in, indefinitely. Yeah. I think of like what kind of headspace and the addiction that you would have had at that time. Like, well, I've, oh, and I've, taught, I've had women in here that have been like that where they think and they're so almost brainwashed to believe that that exercise and that kind of diet is, is what needs to happen in order for them to look good. And it probably is, but that's not a healthy, if they're not healthy on the inside, they may look good on the outside, but the addiction part of it, Kate, like how in the world did you go from being that to switching complete gears, which we'll get into what happened. But like, the, as far as like, did you have like a final straw or did you think like, I have to change things? Like what happened to get you out of that? Because for most women that are in that headspace, they have their blinders on and they cannot look past that. Yeah. I mean, and that's the truth. And I think that's yeah. why women even get in the fitness industry because it at least allows us a platform to do our addiction and not feel as crazy, you know? Yeah. And, and so there was certainly some mental, emotional stuff attached to that, that that was like a whole nother way of working through it. And that, you know, I, and certainly with most people I, or women I work with, there's always another part. There's always another component of just the physical quality of needing to have a body that looks perfect all the time. There is certainly some emotional component of not feeling enough or unless I be this, I'm, I'm not a good person or I'm not enough or whatever that is. But the other part of it is um, when you are so attached to that physicality of you need to look a certain way and now it's not working for you and you're really having to be like, what the hell is going on? For me, I mean, I, I met somebody that was doing a different approach and it, and I, Essentially, I, I started to research Dr. Ray Pete, and you know, if you ever learn, or Dr. Ray Pete is all about using sugar as your energy source, and you have to utilize sugar to have a high running metabolism. And even my 20 plus years in the industry prior, this was never anything that was ever explained to me, ever. I mean, I've done nutrition courses and degrees and physiology. None of this was ever explained about the basic human physiological needs of how your body works. And every diet approach doesn't ever touch these kind of things. It's just kind of like, how do you get lean and fit and so forth? It's not about how does your body run best? Right. So it was a, an entirely different way to look. I mean, I was basically looking through the same window with different colored glasses. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> holy cow, I was seeing the entire world that I had been in for so long completely differently. And so wow. for me, I'm very much, I submerge myself into whatever this new theory is and I just dove in like head first and started to change everything oh wow so explain first what the meta what what is the metabolism how does it function so so that we can yeah. get an understanding of what it means to not have a functioning metabolism right and I think there's a lot of misconception around metabolism because yeah. I don't think most people really understand so metabolism is the function of every metabolic process that goes on, or it's the total, the sum of every metabolic process that's going on in your body. And so that would include your digestion, your libido, your muscles, your nervous system, your hormonal system. Anything that requires energy is going to be a part and running by the, the metabolism. So we utilize like how much energy does it take for your body to work? And that essentially is your metabolism. So where we get skewed with this is there's two ways that you can utilize or burn energy. One is by having an actual high metabolic rate supported by high thyroid function. You're utilizing energy well. That means you're in good health. You have good sleep. You have an easy time you know, maintaining your muscle mass. You're not overweight. And then there's other people that actually can burn a lot of calories, but actually have a very suppressed metabolism. And those are the people that are running on your stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, you're working out a lot, you're stressing the crap out of your body. So you're still using a lot of energy, but not in a way that's going to support good health. And that's where I lived for yeah. 20 years of my life. And that's where a lot of women, we're all living there, right? We're stressing out, we're not eating enough, we're working out like crazy, we're working, we're mothers, we're, we're here in a place where we're abusing our system and our body and burning a lot of energy. But what, what happens when you're burning a lot 
and not supporting a healthy system is your actual functions of the body, digestion, hormones, uh, your libido, all of those things don't get the energy because you're using it in so many other functions, like you're going to run a marathon or whatever, or using it to think. And those resources get depleted. And so they stop working very well. And that's why you start seeing women PMS, can't get fertile, can't lose weight, feel like crap, can't sleep, feel anxious all the time, feel depressed. I mean, you name it, all of those are going to come from a body that isn't working optimally with a good metabolism. Right. How, how, besides those symptoms, how do we know if our metabolism is running optimally? So some easy measures anybody can take is utilizing your body temperature and your pulse rate. So your body temperature during the middle of the day should be about 98.6 or 37 degrees Celsius, waking around 97.8, which I think is like 30.5, around that area, if you can compute it for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And most people now... Pulse is should be between about 80, 90 beats a minute, 75, 80, and everyone's like, what? Right? You always thought you should have a really low pulse. Um, if you are really fit, you are going to have a low pulse. Fit people are very efficient. Um, they usually don't have high running metabolisms, but they do burn a lot of calories because they're super exercise people, right? Doesn't mean you're healthy because you're fit. So low pulse doesn't actually mean that you are healthy, it just means you have low pulse and you're probably fit and can go run a lot. Right. Um, so what you, what I always have people do is I actually have them food log and then we kind of test the measure through the day to see how they're responding to food. Food should actually increase your temperature and pulse. Okay. That's the response because it's fuel. You're putting fire on the kit, you know, in, on the, on, to help burn your, to, to create energy. Um, if per chance, if you're eating, especially if you eat things like sugar and your temp and pulse drop, which can happen. Usually what it says to me is you're running on adrenaline and cortisol and because sugar will suppress adrenaline and cortisol. So if you're hot all the time and you eat sugar and you actually get cooler, then we know that you don't actually have a healthy metabolism, that you actually are running on adrenaline and cortisol and that mm. that effect of sugar just suppress the system in okay. a good way. And that, so are you testing like to someone eat a meal and then test a half an hour, an hour later? How does that work? Yeah. So normally it's, they test it when they wake up in the morning. So you want to get a baseline and then they eat. And then usually about 20, 30 minutes post meal, we test it again. Mm. And we do that usually breakfast, lunch, dinner through the day to see how their body's responding. So someone that isn't functioning optimally, maybe that has blood sugar issues, their temp and pulse is going to go all over the place all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody that's super stressed, you know, every time they eat, temp and pulse are going to drop. Somebody that's running optimally and utilizing food well, their temp and pulse will gradually increase. It'll be the highest at midday and then they'll get cooler as the evening comes. So it kind of runs in a bell curve if they're working optimally. Most people that are going to watch this are going to go home and take their temp and pulse and they're probably going to find out that they're like, Hey, I'm 97, I'm 96 or I'm 36. Right. And they're like, Oh, and that was honestly a big wake up call for me. So I was an athlete, you know, big time prior to this. When I started taking my temp and pulse, it was around 96 during the middle of the day. That's almost three degrees lower than it should be. Yeah, that's Um, cold. That's very cold, right? And so I was like, what? And so I was running super cold and I had no idea. And it just reminded me of when I was in college and I was a super cardio athlete and on a super caloric deficient diet in college. And I was freezing all the time, all the time, right? And I know it never clued into me that it was my metabolism. I was just like, I am small, you know, I don't have a lot of body fat. And that's what I thought it was. And I was driving my metabolism into the toilet and wow. Oh, wow. I know I, t- I take my temperature. I tell all my clients to take their temperature, even if you don't have a thyroid, because I use it for thyroid. But even if you don't have a known thyroid issue, just take your temperature. Like that's such yeah. a great tool that's so cheap that anybody can do from home. That and your blood glucose levels and your pulse, like take it at home. It's just so easy. Take your, take your health into your own hands here, girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, they're I can get more information from temp and polls than your $300 in labs. Yeah. I mean, I like to, you know, you can look at labs. They're 
they can show me what is that blip of information is going on in your one minute of your day that you're taking blood labs. And they do provide some, but quite honestly, taking temple pulse through the day will give me a lot. And you can do it at home and you can see the progression, I mean, of how your body's responding. And you're like, oh my God, you know, in a month or two, you're like, I'm warmer. I feel like I have more energy. I'm sleeping better. And you can say, huh okay, now this makes sense. Now I'm utilizing energy better. I'm producing more heat. So that's why I'm going to be warmer. Do you test um, specific foods? Like if someone wanted to see what kind of foods were, were affecting their metabolism, so would you suggest like not mixing the food? Like would you say, okay, if you want to test protein or you would eat a chicken breast and then see what your metabolism does or does it not matter? It's just a well, food in general. Yeah. So I certainly give them foods that are pro-metabolic and foods that are anti-metabolic, right? And I just really say, avoid these, utilize these, right? So there's lists on what. And then I always have people food combine, right? I always say protein and carbs in every meal, right? So that's going to be ideal to help balance blood sugar. So balancing and stabilizing blood sugar is going to be a big part of somebody healing. Because if you cannot maintain a level of blood sugars through the day with the foods that you're eating, you are going to be all over the place all day long. And people that are sick or stressed or super anxious are going to have a hard time with those things. So we have to create a meal plan and the right meals with the right macros in them to help stabilize them and then work from there because you know i always say the meal you start with is not going to be the meal the pl meal plan you end with it's a right. constant shift we have to change it weekly if not monthly to because their body's going to adapt right and as you heal your body will require more energy and more nutrition and more things right it isn't like this isn't going to fix you it's going to be a progression right and for right. most people they've adapted into a low metabolic state it's taken them years if not decades to get there um, it's not going to be a quick fix it's going to be a slow progression but at this point it's like what choice do you have you're going to keep going down into the hole or we can start pulling you out at least stabilize you and start getting you better it's mm -hmm. just not going to be a 30 60 90 day program yeah. <laughs> right Right. Thank you. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> Trust me. I know <laughs> people want the 30, 60, 90 day, but because I remember learning that in school, like 90 days, we feel is the top that people will purchase as far as a program goes when it comes to weight loss. Like don't go past the, the best sellers are six, four to six weeks. Right. And I was like, what? Like no wonder women yo-yo diets and they just, they can't keep it off. Like no, no program should be able to do any that in six weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you have strong willpower for four to six weeks. Yeah, right? that's I why. Like yeah. that. I was like, yeah. I was all about willpower. I can do it. Like I'm starving. No, I'm not going to eat. Right. And, and, I, and you can live like that for quite a long time period until there's an event. And what I mean by that is something stressful occurs, right? And that mm -hmm. totally throws people off their game. And then that's what they blame. Oh, I wasn't strong enough during that time period, right? I let that throw me off. Or I went to that party and it let me throw me off. I'm like, a good diet should be able to keep you well and stable no matter what event is going on. And so, and I'm not saying we don't have catastrophic events and that might throw you off. But even then, people I've worked with, when something horrible may happen or super stress will happen, they're able to remain in a healthy place until they can get through it. And then they, you know, they might fall back a little bit. They're not the cuckoo person they were before, right? I mean, they can, they're much more stable and sane. And, and we've all experienced that when something horrible happened, you know, people fall off the edge. And that's when they go to medications and sleep aids and all of these different things to help pull them up. But that, none of that stuff's fixing them. No, it's all to do with metabolism, isn't it? Like if you're running proper metabolism, not just weight loss, but it's, it's everything. Like you said before, there's a component to every part of your body. Like your bowels will get better. Your, your, your skin, everything gets better. One, yeah. When you realize every function of your body is running based on how your cells use energy, that's how you heal. That's how everything works optimally. And if the cells aren't getting enough energy and nutrition, or there's some sort of dysfunction there, then things are going to start adapting, right? Our body's always adapting to the stressors we put upon it, good and bad, right? You work, do a weight training program, you work out, your body adapts by building muscle. That's a good thing. 
you don't eat, you starve yourself, you try to diet, you, you reduce carbohydrate, your body will adapt some way by losing weight, but the other way is it slows function down. Your body says, oh, not giving me any energy, so I better slow your energy needs down so that I don't die. And that's what it does. And that there's always an adaptation going to happen when you reduce carbohydrate. Always. Always. Thank you. Always. Always. <laughs> always. I try to preach this high and low. Yeah. Right? High and low. And it, I'm like always talking about that. Because <laughs> low carb diets really, uh, they really stamp out hunger. Unfortunately, and yeah. fortunately, like it's good yeah. and bad, right? For somebody that's really overweight and that always has troubles overeating and has a sugar addiction, a low carb diet is sometimes like like they, they, a miracle for them because they're like, finally, my appetite is suppressed and I don't feel right. like I need to eat all the time. And and I think in the beginning stages, this is extremely healing and therapeutic for for some people. Sure. And then what we start seeing as time goes on, and I mean across the board, and maybe this is just because I get them in my office, but I would say, I would go as high as saying like 95 to 99% of women at some point in their low carb journey, it, the weight loss stops, comes to a screeching halt. Yep. They, they, their hunger levels are so low at this point that they're, they're fasting, you know, five days, seven days a week. They eat one to two meals a day. They're, you know, maybe bringing in 500, 600 calories. And they're, they think that they should just keep doing that because that's what worked in the beginning. But what is actually happening to their metabolism? Yeah, you are suppressing the crap out of yourself. And mm -hmm. here's the thing. When you do a reduction of calories initially, and your body does burn some body fat, for that to happen, your stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, they rise, right? And you get this thing called the catecholine effect, which the catecholines are your stress hormones elevated, and they make you feel good. You got a lot of energy, you're thinking clear, right? And so when you are running from a lion, and you have this adrenaline spike. I mean, you have so much clarity. You, I mean, you have all this energy. I mean, you feel, you know, like Superman. And then what is initially happening on a lot of these diets, and that can last for quite a long time depending on how they're doing it until it doesn't, you know, and, and I see the same thing is that they do the low carb, they get some results, they lose some weight, they feel pretty good, and then they might start to have some digestive issues, or maybe some hormonal issues, then their sleep starts to go, yeah. and then they get anxious, and then it just, then they're falling off the cliff, right? And at this point, they need to be pulled up quickly, um, but you can't, at this point, you have to know how to adapt these people back to a carbohydrate fill because it, it's not as easy to just go out and eat all the carbohydrates. I mean, you could, um, you're just not going to, you're not going to like the result of that. It's usually people gain weight quite quickly. Didn't you do that? Something like that? Like when you went yeah. back, when you, yeah, you I mean, kind of went I, too far the other way? <laughs> totally. Yeah. In fact, when I approached it, I was like, okay, you know, I was no dairy, basically no sugar, maybe some berries. I went, like I said, I was eating all the saturated fat now, cheese and milk and fruit and, you know, all of these things. And my body went, you know, and, but I, I kept with it and, and I, you know, had I known I, I needed to certainly uh, go a lot slower and you certainly do need to do that when you incorporate carbohydrates back into your diet. Um, and I, you know, and I went and I had some adverse things. I think my cholesterol went up to like 330. I mean, and it, like my body completely rebounded. Now <clears throat> Don't do what I did. Like, don't go in 110%. And, and your body will do some shifts, right? If you don't understand how physiology works and really about cholesterol and so forth, there might be some things that happen that your doctor might say aren't positive, but it's, it's usually your body's trying to shift. Cholesterol is not bad. It's probably just taking a, a teeter because maybe you were super inflamed, which I know I was. Um, and it just did these rebound effects. But like, probably within a year, everything kind of balanced back out. Um, but it definitely, uh, it, it definitely went over to the, the other side for quite a while. And I see that all the time as people go too fast and they have some negative things that happen. And it's not that it's not, if you understand what's going on, you will understand why that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but you can prevent that by going a much, much slower. Because people that go super low carb, they do, the longer they do it for, the, the more sensitive they are to the carbohydrates. So when they eat them, they're going to gain weight? Normally. Well, right. and they might, their body, I mean, their body, you have, when you shift to a fat adapted metabolic rate, which everybody thinks that that is a good thing. And, and 
in a survival mode, it is a good thing, right? And you have to remember, this is how your body functions. It always prefers sugar as energy. It's the most usable. It runs, the cells prefer that. They run more optimally. As soon as you stop giving your body its preferred energy, your brain and your body basically knows, hey, our ideal source of energy is not here. We're going into secondary resources like fat or protein or possibly ketone. We, for us to know that we're going to survive, we're going to slow metabolic rate down now. We're going to tell your body we don't need as much energy because you're not giving us our primary source anymore. So things start to slow. Now, it might not happen immediately. It does take time. And usually when you're on one of these kind of diets, you're, not, you're usually eating less in general. When you remove an entire macronutrient, you're going to eat less. And so you're starting to eat less. Now you might be eating less frequently, right? Now you're intermittent fasting. So now you're eating in this five, six hour window. And so you can kind of keep it going for so long until, like, again, you're going to crash out, you know? And a lot of times, mostly with women, they really start to have a lot of hormonal issues, which mm -hmm. is, this is, keto is not a diet if you want to maintain hormonal balance to ever get up, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of had to go, I went hard the keto way because I saw so many amazing results with keto. Sure. And then the longer I was using it with my clients, the more repercussions I was seeing. So then I had to kind of pull back and be like, okay, how do I have this, like the best of both worlds coming in where you can fix insulin resistance by fasting sometimes and not eating the, the crappy food and the high sugars but then how do I keep the metabolism and the adrenal system healthy and up and running? Because you can't on an extremely low carb diet for long term. No. So it's finding this like this, which I feel like I have like with like you, I've, I really studied Ray Pete and other people that have really brought all of this to my attention. And there's a lot of stuff coming out, like even about going too low carb for too long will actually can cause insulin resistance by going too low carb for too long. People are yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you can, you know, I've seen people in a diabetic state or almost in a diabetic state or pre-diabetic state that are super low carb mm -hmm. because when you stress the system and I think, you know, diabetes is quite misunderstood from my perspective. Um, yeah. We mark it as high sugar in the blood for long periods of time. But the question is why is sugar in the blood? right? Why is it not getting into the cell? Why are we not able to utilize it? Is it because we're eating too much of it? That could be partially the reason. But a lot of reason is that diabetics also have high fat in the blood as well. And when you have high fat and high sugar in the blood, they're going to compete with each other to get into right. the cell. And what happens is fat wins. Fat is utilized as your energy source. So when you consume tons of sugar with high fat in the blood, the sugar remains in the, in the blood. So you come up as hyperglycemic, and so they're saying, oh, it's the sugar's fault. So it does help to remove the sugar, but you're still having the problem because if you remove the sugar, you're still now going to have lots of fat in the blood because that's what you're using in your energy. So again, once you reintroduce it again, you're having that same problem. So the question always becomes, can you fix that by consuming high sugar? And there's tons of research out there that says that you can, mm -hmm. right? But you have to remove the fat. And so... Most people, if you're in a diabetic state, we were all totally scared and fearful of this, but if they actually go more high carb and eat the right carbs and remove a lot of the fat and go super low fat for long periods of time, they can fix their diabetic state. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I haven't heard that before. So <laughs> yes. are we talking bad fats? Well, it depends like, on what, right. So usually when you want to go this route, you want to remove like soup. You want to go, you don't want to have comp competition with any. Coconut oil might be a little bit different because it's utilized differently. Okay. So that one, but you still want to stay pretty low fat for them to do that because you want the body to, to get back to utilizing sugar as energy. And you also, you know, you don't want to over consume. You don't want to be consuming way, way too much but you want to get into a state where it's pretty, pretty low fat. You want to utilize carbohydrates that are easily usable, right? And that's actually more of the simple ones. I mean, but I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Will, William Kempner no. uh, back in the, I think the fifties and he developed the rice diet and the rice diet was basically rice, sugar, fruit, and juice. Oh, wow. It was the whole diet. <laughs> and he, he cured people of like hypertension diabetes, kidney issues, 
I mean, the list goes on and I'm not telling people to go do that diet. If you have, yeah. I don't think it's the ideal diet, but it did give us information about how the system works and that it's not completely a sugar disorder that right. a lot of times, and you know, I always think it's the polyunsaturated fats um, that is the main cause of that. <clears throat> and I'm sure that you probably dove into that a little bit. Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you, because right, when you're releasing fat to utilize as energy, depending on what you've been eating, a lot of it can be the polyunsaturated fats. And if those are being released and used in energies that they can already have a thyroid suppressing effect, they can suppress mitochondria function. They do so many other anti-metabolic things to the system that you're just going to be on this constant hamster wheel of getting sicker. And where are we getting the polyunsaturated fats for those that don't know? Right. Where that so comes from? I know everyone's like, huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> polyunsaturated fat are your liquid fats. So those would be vegetable oil, canola oil, your nut and seed oils contain a good amount of polyunsaturated fats. Um, those are the primary ones that we're using to cook with and so forth. They are in your nuts and seeds. Um, those are high proof of foods. So they're not, they're, they're a lot of the foods that we've been told to eat. Um, they are more the cholesterol lowering ones. The, the polyunsaturated fats can lower cholesterol. That is one of their selling points. Um, but they do it usually in a way that's suppressing immune function or suppressing the liver's function to produce cholesterol. So, you know, we need cholesterol. Um, and you know, people don't know that cholesterol is, uh, the, the base of all of our steroidal hormones. And, you know, so we need it. We want it. We just we need to understand it better. Mm -hmm. What do you think happened that made everything start to shift when you hit your forties? What was that doing to? What does that do to a woman's metabolism? So I personally don't like to say it's an age thing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I personally just think I stressed the crap out of my system for so long that I finally just hit the wall. And I, quite honestly, looking back, there was, I probably hit the wall a few times, but when I'd hit it, I maybe rebounded by doing something a little bit better, right? I mean, I used to eat processed soy foods all the time because I thought that was healthy back in my 20s. Yeah, I went and through so, that phase. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh, God, no wonder. And so, I mean, the diet that I had in my 30s was better than what I had in my 20s. So I probably had rebounded a little bit, but it was still not an ideal diet. Um, so for me, I mean, I was 20 years of doing crap to myself, totally over-exercising, totally stressing myself, totally eating and, and, and binging too, because I would restrict sugars for so long. So there was, I think, just so much time of abuse had, had, had taken its toll. You know, maybe it's around 40 that, that we hit that, you know, and I think for a lot of women, 40s are a year where, you know, a lot of them are having kids, they're still trying to work. They're tr trying to do everything and they're still trying to be thin during this. You know, men don't get that pressure nearly like women do. No. So we're trying to do everything and do try to do and doing everything and not feeding our body and still trying to work out like crazy people. And it's, it's just, it's not functional. No. Um, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, we preach that, you know, we see these women that are super fit and doing everything. And I'm like, ah. you know, those are the, those are the women that I get phone calls from that feel like complete crap. They look good, yeah. but they feel horrible. Yeah. So when we're talking sugar, what kind of sugar are we talking about here? Because I, I could just right. see all these people thinking like, what are these women talking about? Like, what, you want me to go out and eat some cake now? Like, right. I can't do that. Yeah. So no, that is a great question. Because people, this is where people get like, what? Um, the sugars I'm referencing, even though sugar is sugar is sugar, yeah. but sugar is best in nutrition. And so this is going to be fruits, fruit juices are good, honey. Um, I like dairy and milk. Milk has good sugar in it. Root vegetables. These are all your ideal sources because they're going to pack energy, sugar, and nutrition. Because as we know, as, as I've been saying, is that sugar and, uh, is going to increase metabolic, right? With that, your body's needs for nutrition are going to increase. So if you consume lots of sugar without any nutrition, you're going to have a lot of nutritional deficiencies and you're going to get sick, right? <clears throat> it's not really sugar's fault. It's basically just increased your demand of need of nutrition on your body. So you want those two combinations together so that your body gets basically what it's needing um, energetically and nutritionally. So those are the primary ones I use. I mean, I'm not talking about cookies and cakes and candy mm -hmm. 
and all of this stuff, you know, I'm not saying you can't ever have those things. I don't believe in any of that. I'm just saying that's not what I'm talking about. People think, well, I ate a bunch of cake and I, you know, that felt like crap. And I go, A, cake is not just sugar. Most of the calories are usually coming from a fat source, right? The vegetable oil you put in there or whatever else you added into it. And then there's flour. So the sugar is just a minor part, but we reference anything sweet. We think that's a sugar thing, right? Sugar, fat things, cake, cookies, all those are, there's, there's more evil in both of those. And like I said, if we broke it down, it's really not sugar's fault. It's all the other things with it. Um, highly palatable foods are going to have sweetness to them, right? But they're usually also going to have fat to them too. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for people to overeat. So, you know, fruits and yeah. juice and all those things aren't something that people usually are going to overeat on. I mean, you certainly can. And I'm not saying this is a green light to just eat copious amounts of that all the time. Because if you do, you're going to get sick and you're going to gain weight. Yeah. Um, it needs to be implemented in a way that your body can balance blood sugar. That's a big key. Something where you can monitor your temp and pulse to, to see how your body's energy needs and how everything is being taken in. So there, there is a, a little bit more to it than just saying all these things, but those are your best resources when we're actually talking about sugar. Yeah. Now, what about for someone that's, you know, quite has quite a bit of weight to lose and they're wanting to try to, like their metabolism's in the toilet, they take their temperature. How do you increase your foods and still lose weight? Like, do you eventually get to a place where, yes, you can lose weight just by adding, just by eating more of the right food? Yeah. So those people are interesting. And this is what I find. Like if you're pretty overweight and you're coming in and you're telling me you're eating 1200 calories, right? First off, you're not eating 1200 calories all the time. You would lose weight. Um, usually people that are eating 1200 calories, then they're eating excessive amounts on the weekends or whatever else. But if you are you know, you're not eating a lot, we slowly start to increase your cal calories. And what usually happens over time is you might be eating 12 or 1500 calories. We might need to increase that to 2000 to 3000 calories in a year or so forth. We will have you eating almost twice as much food and you will be losing weight because now your body's utilizing the energy that we're giving it. Now it's feeling safe enough to say, Oh, she's giving me more energy. I'm going to use more energy. But what's going to happen in the meantime is you're going to start sleeping better you're gonna start having more energy. You're not gonna have energy fluctuations through the day. Your PMS might disappear. You know, your skin's gonna look better because now your body's utilizing the energy that you're actually giving it. We're not trying to restrict you anymore. This isn't about you having to restrict or, we're not trying to actually make you not be hungry. Like I wanna do the opposite. I wanna actually get you hungry because if I know you're hungry, it means that your body's saying, hey, I need more energy now. We want to get you to use the maximum amount of energy you possibly can. And when you start doing that, and then you start moving around, we can utilize exercise as a tool now, right? Now, I'm not going to ever make you try to exercise your weight off, right? You, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. We want to use it as a tool to either help you build lean muscle mass or to give you enough movement to start triggering some weight loss. So it's a dance, right? It's about starting here and working yourself up and, and, and monitoring how you're feeling. Um, for people that, that do need to lose weight, you know, um, you have to reprogram yourself because this is, if, if you're sick or your metabolic rate is low, it's not the first thing that's going to happen. We got to fix things first so mm -hmm. that when we, we start supporting you and increase metabolic rate, that what, now that you're up here, you're going to have a lot easier time losing weight and you're going to feel a lot better. So at the end of the diet, you're not eating half the calories you were. You're eating twice as many calories as you were and maybe even working out less. Right. Because that's what we normally do. I work out a lot less than I ever have in my entire life now. You know, I mean, I used to work out 14 hours a week. I mean, I might work out three now. Yeah. I mean, I just utilize it better. I feel better. I don't need to do those things. I was running on adrenaline all the time and I was so crazy and addicted that I couldn't even fathom thinking of taking a day off. It just would make me crazy, right? And that was the other part of the addiction. That's also a blood sugar issue, you know? So it's always amazing to see when women go through this process, they're like, this is the first time I went on vacation and I didn't get up at five in the morning and, and work out. And I, and I actually feel okay. And I had more energy and I ate more and I came home and I lost two pounds. 
I mean, you know, they are like, Whoa! you know, so it's, it's really cool when that happens. Yeah. I think too, like women have to look, like I, I talk to clients that will, they, they think that the reason they're not losing weight is because they, you know, once in a while they'll have some chocolate or they go for ice cream or they had pizza once a week or, or something that is so minute. And I'm like, yeah, listen, if your metabolism is, metabolism is running properly, you can do that and you're not going to gain, that's not going to be what's stopping you from losing weight. So put like, shove that aside. That is not it. It's, it's, it has something to do with something else in the system that's not working yeah. properly. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I would say like, you know, we got to rebuild the house before we can start trying to lose weight. We got to build the foundation back, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that happens with time and, you know, and it depends like, you know, women that are older and they've been dieting chronically all their life, that's going to be a bigger challenge for them. Can it happen? 100%. It's just going to take time. If you've been doing this for 30 or 40 years, we can't fix you in six months. But one thing I will say, in six months, you're going to be healthy and you're going to feel better. And one year, you're going to be a lot healthier, better, you know, and maybe in three or four years, and you know, women don't like to hear that. It, that's might what it takes to get things to really shift. But what's going to happen in the time period is your mind is going to shift. You're going to focus on different things. Like we got to change the narrative around the fitness and health industry to get you refocused on what is going to be healthy for you and not just what's going to lose, make you lose weight quick. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that, that alone, the the whole fast weight loss thing has gotten us in a lot, a lot of trouble. And, you know, for the 40, 50 years that we've really had the fitness boom and all this stuff going on, we've gone seriously more overweight and more sick. And so it's like, (laughs) what, that shouldn't happen if we're doing things properly. And it has. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so what, we need to completely change how we're looking at this and readjust our, our, our measurement levels for one, but just what are we doing and how is this going to happen? What, what can we do for long-term health? And so, you know, that's the conversation I like to have because the other one hasn't been working. <laughs> clearly, clearly. I always think we got to do what our great grandma's grandmas did. Like they weren't counting calories. They weren't, you know, watching their Fitbit to see how many steps they've been taking. They're not going to yeah. the gym. And they ate like three solid big meals a day. Yeah. They had every, every macro in it. They were having their fresh bread with their slice of ham. Their bread would have like, what, what's the... Uh, the pig fat on it, the lard. Uh, yep. <laughs> right. Like it was this like very, and even yeah. after dinner, there was always dessert, you know, but yep. it was like these three really big meals a day yep. and there was no obesity rates. Like there, it was less than 4% before the 1970s. So it's like, what were these people doing that we're not doing? I mean, we have, we do have so much more stuff coming at us than they did. right? Like toxins and everything. And I think that that's an important thing to understand that what she's saying, what Kay's saying, what I'm saying is each one of you is very individual and what it's going to take to fix that metabolism is going to look different. Like she said, you may have to start so slow with just tiny bits of carbohydrates added back into your diet. You know, like each person is going to look very differently as far as, you know, getting that metabolism up and running again. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is a, <clears throat> and it will, and it will blow your mind. It, I mean, I'm not, t- t- it, it, you know, I've been doing this for, I think nine years now and it still blows my mind. Not as much as it used to. Like at the beginning, I'm always like, wait, I have to have sugar and carbohydrates. Like I just couldn't get my head wrapped around oh, it for yeah. so long. It was such and you know, and when you're in the fitness industry and you know, you're really you're dug deep in your roots of this is all horribly wrong for you. And so yeah. you're finally shown the way and then you realize I have to change. And when you do and you start preaching this initially, everyone looks at you like you're insane, right? And because it isn't a quick fix, it just isn't. Um, but to me, you know, prior to this, it was a new diet every six months, a new shift, a new this, you know, this is the only thing I've done nine years. It still is the only thing that makes sense. Um, and it has worked the best for long term, you know, because people just get better if you stick to it, right? And you have to be just, you have to be in. You can't try to do this and then restrict carbs on the weekend, right? If there's not, because people still try to go back to their own mentality. 
right? We have to understand our nerve, our brain is wired a certain way. And if you've been just restricting for 30 years, it's not going to fix itself in, in six months. I mean, it might take a long time, but to constantly stay in it and know that what you're looking for, you know, and you're, you're using tempo and pulse and you're feeling better, then you know you're on the right path. Mm-hmm. So fruits, roots and vegetables, protein, saturated fats, right? Is that what you said? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah I mean, it's kind of like food, general. Yeah. The general is fruits and roots, easy to digest protein, more, more animal-based. Dairy yes. is a big component. Um, I understand a lot of people don't do well on dairy. So that's something that we address. Um, usually most of the people I work with, uh, if they haven't been doing dairy, usually about 80% within a few months, we got them back on dairy again and they do fine on it. Um, it's removing the polyunsaturated fats, using fats like coconut oil, butter, ghee, um, you know, food that tastes good. Um, yeah. <laughs> you'll be satisfied. You're not ever going to feel restricted. Yes. You're going to start feeling happier. Like, oh my God, I can have orange juice again. Um, things are just going to, you will feel better. And, and like I said, and the trick is going slow, getting help if you need it, you know, and cause if you don't, if you go too fast in, um, uh, you're not going to feel so great. No, definitely yeah. not. Yeah. You have to ease your way back in. I yes. would have to say like when people ask me how I eat, that's how I've eaten probably for 10 years. I, I've, I definitely use keto as a therapeutic tool and fasting as a tool too. And I do that a few days a week sort of thing. I know you said not to, but I, I find it works for me <laughs> just because, and I, but I've listened to my cycle with that. There's times where I just need to give my system a break. And then other times I go out and I have a massive breakfast. And so I am doing different things, but I'm, I am doing that kind of the, the, I, I feel best when I'm doing the, the Mac, all three macros at, at a meal. Like that's yeah. when I'm, I'm sus, like satiated for a very long time. If I'm missing one of those, I uh, find that I'm like, I get more hungry. I'll be like, yeah. Oh geez, why am I hungry? I'm like, Oh, I just had a piece of protein for, for yeah. breakfast. I didn't put in, you know, some fruit or whatever a smoothie with it. And yeah, it's the mix. I have to have the fat, the carb, the protein, and I feel best. Right. But, and I yep. think that everybody can get there. That's it's, it's whole foods, right? Do you have a place for the grains and the beans in your own personal diet or? Um, for most people, especially initially, it's something that we remove. I mean, a yeah. lot of what I deal with, you know, I'm sure you see it too. A lot of people have horrible digestive systems. Yeah. And I mean, America is known for our horrible grains and God knows what we're doing to the, to the seeds here. So a lot of people get massive digestive issues. And so a big part of this is explaining what we want to eat easy to digest foods because we actually want your body to get the energy out of it, not have to use all the energy to try to digest it. And so a lot of the foods that are hard to digest are beans and nuts and even leafy green vegetables, right? Everyone's like, what? Leafy greens. I'm like, yeah, your kales, your spinach, they are highly nutritious foods. However, your body, the human body has a really hard time breaking those down and getting what it needs out of it. And so if it's, you're giving it a two calorie food and it takes six calories to break that food down, how much usable energy are you getting? None. You're in a deficit, you Mm -hmm. know, so you're not, we're not helping support the body. Um, to me, nothing is off limits when you get healthy, it's just utilizing. And so initially we, we break it down to getting rid of the, a lot of those foods and then possibly adding them in, um, on a needs basis. Some people never add them back in cause they decide I don't like those foods. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's me. I can't do, I'll, I'll never go back to that because I just don't feel good when I eat them. I try. It's like, Oh, yeah. nope, I can't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially the, you know, like if you want to soak and sprout your beans and, eat them with some fat with them and, and make sure you chew them really well, you know, and not have seen amounts of them, then they can be okay. Um, it's still not an ideal source, but again, you have to see what you're working with, right? If you won't eat any animal foods, um, that might be a food you have to work with. Still not ideal, you know, for me, mm-hmm. everyone should be eating some animal food. Same. So. Yeah. Yeah. I have to agree with that. And I agree with the veg, the leafy greens, especially like, I think I heard you say this once too, where it's like, do you really want to, would you ever just go grab a piece of kale and just start chowing on it? Mm, No, like that kind of thing we want to cover and smother in a dressing for a to right. be palatable. Yeah. And I interviewed CJ Hunt on this podcast and he 
uh, did this documentary on, I think it's called the perfect health diet or, but anyways, he traveled the world and he went to these like, um, archeological burial grounds and they were checking the DNA of, uh, what hunter gatherers ate. And he said minuscule amounts of greens. And I'm like, well, yeah, they would have been bitter greens and no, you know, as a caveman, you were walking along, picking up this stuff because it tasted good and started chewing on it. He said, yeah. most of it was tubers, fat, animal fat and animals. Like he's yep. like, that, that's what made us human. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have anything else available, you eat these greens, right? But yeah. I think we got confused because all of a sudden we found these foods that were, they have a lot of nutrition in them and they have no calories. And so we're like, that's the ideal food, right? That's what we want. I'm like, not if you want a high metabolism, that's not what you <laughs> Don't <laughs> just eat starving. salad. Right. And who no, can? I'm starving. Right? Oh, yeah, I right. did. I used to eat salads like two, three a day sometimes. I mean, it's huge. And I would get severe bloating. I always had a like pooch <laughs> belly for years. And it's like, there's all those things I could address. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not saying don't eat your greens, people. I think it's, I always eat salad, not three large salads a day though. And I don't make that my primary source of fuel for sure. Yeah. It's a good side. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a good side, you know, put a little fat on it or cook it. I mean, there are yes. better ways to consume it. It just doesn't need to be your, your biggest meal three days a week or three days, three times a day. Yes. Yeah. So how can people find you work with you? What do you have to offer uh, my listeners? So there's, Free information on my website, uh, it's katedeering.com, um, but I honestly post most on Facebook and Instagram today, so you can find me at Kate Deering Fitness, um, both Facebook and on Instagram, and I post daily with free stuff that is, you know, little blippets here and there that will certainly make your, your mind churn. Um, the, the, the basis of everything that I'm talking about or we're talking about is in a book I wrote, it's called How to Heal Your Metabolism. That'll give you a really good understanding of why maybe you know, what you've been doing isn't working. If you're, if you're at that point, you, you maybe you're not, everything might be great right now, but if you're still looking for answers, this definitely opens the eyes to a lot of people. And they're like, holy cow, like this is what I've been missing um, on an energetic standpoint. And uh, so it, it certainly um, will make you think if anything. Yeah. I, th I would recommend actually for all my listeners to grab the book because I think it's information that even if you think what we're talking about is crazy and you don't want to do it, open your mind up, read the book, get, you know, I think, it, you know, knowledge is power, people. And this is, you, you got to hear this because she's, she's right. <laughs> she is. She's just right. Okay. <laughs> but yes. Yeah. I think it's something that everybody should read, especially women that are struggling to lose weight. Yeah. Or it, like I said, if anyone at this point, if you're in your thirties or fifties or 40, mm -hmm. you know, and you are not at your ideal weight or your ideal health, um, it will definitely open your eyes to a lot. And some people, it can be as simple as they just reintroduce some easy to digest carbohydrates and they yes. immediately start feeling better, you know? And they're like, oh my God, I don't eat these, all this leafy greens anymore and I feel better. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's not yeah. great surgery. It, it is a lot of common sense when people yeah. are like, oh my God. But um, we're so far from that in today's world that you have to be reminded about how your body works. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. I mean, my, my, whenever women have been following a keto diet for a long time and they get that weight loss plateau that happens, I'm like, there's one, one answer. Just start, start putting in some potato, sweet potato, like go back to paleo or go to paleo. And they're like, well, what's that? I'm like, just start adding some good carbs back into your diet. And across the board, they all come back saying, oh my God, I lost 10 pounds or I lost five pounds. Oh, I got going again. Now I feel so much better. My weights have gotten coming back off again. I'm like, there you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Carbs you are your friend. They're not your enemy. They can be your friend. Yes. They can yes. be. Yes. yes. The right ones. ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's just be really clear. The right, right. ones. Good, yes. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate the conversation. My pleasure. It was fun to be here. <laughs>